So it is eight o'clock on the dot. So I'm going to kick this off. I'd first like to thank all of our participants for coming to the second near service geophysics open source software webinar. This webinar is one that I've been particularly excited about as it's about QGIS. And I've used QGIS both before and during grad school and at I think every job I've ever had. So as someone who has many thanks to get for QGIS, I'm very excited for this webinar. With that said, we have Kurt Menke and Saber here to present to us about QGIS. Kurt runs a successful consulting business in the US. He is a spatial analyst, cartographer, educator, author, and OSGO charter member. And he's also published many books on QGIS. Saber is co-founded Lutra Consulting in 2009 and has been providing open source software solutions in the field of geographical, geographic information systems for the past 12 years. Lucha is one of the lead developers of QGIS, and he also graduated from the University of Birmingham with a master's in water engineering. So with that said, I'd like to hand it off to Kurt to get started with the first presentation on QGIS. And I also want to thank both of you guys for being here to present here. This is really helpful for us and all the students and everyone in the near service community. So thank you. Absolutely. Nice to be here. Um, slight correction. I used to run my own consulting business in the US. And during the pandemic, my wife and I relocated to Denmark. So I, uh, I'm an American citizen, but I'm living in Denmark now. And I work for a company named Septima based in Copenhagen. I'm going to start with a short introduction to QGIS and talk about the QGIS community a bit. And then the second 15 minutes, I'm going to go through a short case study uh, to show you a use of QGIS and what you see here flashing across the screen are some of the recent banners for different, every version of QGIS gets one of these uh, banners that opens up. And so you're seeing the different banners from the last couple of years scroll by here as we get started. So QGIS is a desktop GIS software. So it's something you can use to view spatial data, visualize it, symbolize it, analyze data, edit data, and create maps. And it was all started by this gentleman on the left, Gary Sherman, back in 2002. And he needed some software to view spatial data stored in the database at the time. And so he built his own and open sourced it and called it Quantum GIS. It was officially just shortened to QGIS in 2013, I guess, version two. So it's simply QGIS now or QGIS. Um, and we're right now at version 322 or 326. And the reason there's two version numbers now is that QGIS has a fast development pace. Every So every year, there's every spring, there's a version called the LTR, the long-term release published. And that's a version that will um, go through a calendar year with no new features. So it's stable. So that's really useful for people working in a production environment or teaching at a school because you have a stable piece of software for the year. Meanwhile, every four months, there's a new stable release. So every February, June, and October, there's a new stable release put out there. So if you're really into some of the new features, you might choose to have the current stable release installed. And so the current one is 326. And um, you can actually have both installed at the same time. And one of the nice things about QGIS is that it's possible to install it on every single operating system out there. This is what it would look like when you open it up. It looks a lot like most GIS software with a, a panel for your GIS layers. There's a browser panel for adding data from your hard drive and other data providers. And we first, this startup screen that first appears is like a welcome page where you have your um, recent project thumbnails here. So you could open up one of those projects by clicking on it. And there's a news feed from the um, QGIS community with things that might be important about new releases of QGIS and things like that. 
So when you get into QGIS and you've added some data and you save your QGIS project, you create a file, which is a QGZ file. So this stores the path to the data if you're using local file-based data, but not the data itself. So you have to be organized and put your organize your data in such a way that if you move the project, um, the project file and all the data stay together as you move it. And the QG, uh, the project files uh, stores things like the layer order, the symbology assigned to different layers, the most recent map extent, and things like that. So one of the things that makes QGIS so powerful is that QGIS is, has a bunch of underlying open source libraries kind of under the hood, you could say. Um, so you don't necessarily need to know that all these things are working for you, but QGIS has, for example, uses a library called Proj for handling coordinate systems and projections. And there's another um, tandem library, um, Google and OGR for reading and writing raster and vector data and some processing libraries. So all of these combined make QGIS a really powerful package, um, including the GRASS as a standalone desktop GIS, and you can use all the GRASS processing tools in QGIS without having to learn how to use GRASS itself. Um, so this, this is um, really one of the keys to the success of QGIS is that there's all this other work that it's built on top of. So <clears throat> this is the data source manager for QGIS. And down the left-hand side, you see all these different tabs, and these are for adding different kinds of data to QGIS. And that's why I put this Swiss army knife on here because QGIS really is like a Swiss army knife of geospatial data. And it's probably the reason I started using it first was that I could add almost every kind of data to QGIS and start working with it. And so you'll see, it's now possible to add this thing called mesh data, which I'll show an example of in a few minutes, uh, point cloud data, which is becoming a very powerful data set, connections to different databases, data served across the internet via different protocols. And then of course, just the browser tab where you can browse your hard drive for other local files. And so QGIS um, really is a Swiss army knife for GIS data. It also has a really powerful geoprocessing environment. So geoprocessing just means ways that you can manipulate and get more information around your GIS layers. So it has on this left-hand side, a, a toolbox with hundreds of tools in it with, there's a, a search box at the top. So you can type in a keyword up here and filter that toolbox to make it easy to find the tool you're looking for. This big um, window across the center of the slide is a, uh, a GIF of the processing modeler where you can outlay a whole workflow visually and basically create your own custom processing tool for a workflow. There's a batch processing uh, mode that you can use if you need to clip a whole series of data layers, for example, you could batch process that. And there's a Python console. So if you, um, are interested in using the QGIS Python API and you're familiar with Python, you can use Python in the Python console to do things to QGIS and your GIS data. So really flexible. This is just a quick slide showing the all the different ways you can symbolize data in QGIS. So there's renderers for point data, line data like roads, polygons or county boundaries, raster data, and so I'm not gonna go through all this, but just to say that QGIS has a huge array of different possibilities for symbolizing data. With each one of these, you can combine them with these symbol layer types down below. So there's really a limitless way of symbolizing data in QGIS, some of which are very um, state of the art. So QGIS has really like the best symbology engine of, of any GIS out there in my opinion. It has a dedicated 3D environment. So this is a image of Mount Rainier in the 3D viewer with the, the main route to the top of Mount Rainier shown. So this 3D viewer supports all the data that QGIS supports. So you can extrude vector data into 3D. It supports mesh data. It supports point clouds. 
um, and this is a, a digital elevation model. And so you can look at the data from different perspectives and create fly throughs and things like that that you'd expect with a 3D viewer. And QGIS also supports um, mesh data and time-based data. So uh, this is a mesh data set that covers Hurricane Ian that just hit Florida um, a couple weeks ago, or not, yeah, a couple weeks ago, I guess, at this point. And so I was able to very quickly put together uh, an animation because this data model supports time and I can show how the hurricane moved across Florida um, in time and put the, the timestamp on the map. So QGIS has some really nice um, tools like this to allow you to do very sophisticated data visualizations. It also has two data collection apps. There's one called QField produced by a Swiss company, opengis.ch. And there's Merge and Maps produced by Lutra Consulting. Um, um, and you'll hear from Sauber after me. And um, so both of these can be used to collect data on a mobile device based on projects developed in QGIS. So QGIS is open source. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that means because it's important to the dynamics around QGIS. So it mainly has to do with the license. So proprietary software like Microsoft PowerPoint that I'm using here will have a license that restricts your usage in some way, like the, the time you can use the software, the number of features you have access to, the number of computers you can install it on. Open source software also has a license, but that flips it upside down and grants you rights and freedoms as a user of the software. So um, it's a you know, very um, interesting model, the open source model, and it basically becomes a duocracy, which I'll talk about in a minute. So QGIS is both software, but it's also a community. So this is a, a photograph from the 2019 um, QGIS conference in A Coruña, Spain. And um, so QGIS has, the, the QGIS community is, is an integral part of the whole of the software and is how the software continues to evolve and develop. So QGIS itself is now established as a nonprofit based in Switzerland. Importantly, it has no paid staff. It has a fairly small budget. It has a steering committee that operates democratically to uh, coordinate project activities and disseminate information around the project and things like that. There's some links down here. I could provide this PowerPoint afterwards if, if um, people want. But there, so there are links on the QGIS webpage for the governance docs and things like that. So it's all available. So what makes QGIS a success? Well, it's the people, really. And it's a community effort, a team effort. So one thing to think about as you start using QGIS is that you're then by default a user and part of the community when you start using it. And that's an important position because if you encounter a bug, for example, and don't report it, it may not be discovered and then it won't get fixed. So we all kind of have a role in making QGIS what it is, even if we're just a casual user. So what are all these people contributing? Well, there's a lot, but you know, maintaining the website, developing the software, um, teaching courses, um, submitting bug reports, all sorts of things. Personally, one of the things I do is write books on QGIS, and this has been a big year for me. I just had two books come out, QGIS for Hydrological Applications, the second edition on the left with my co-author Hans von der Klost, and Discover QGIS 3X um, on the right, both through Locate Press. One of the ways the community gets organized and meets are these contributor meetings and conferences. So these are some shots from some of the conferences over the recent years. I really recommend these. It's a very welcoming community, especially to newcomers. And um, they're a lot of fun. You get to actually meet with the developers of the software, which you won't be able to do typically with a proprietary software. And another way to interact with the community there are things in QGIS called Easter eggs. So this is a GIF of QGIS. I have the main welcome screen open. And what I'm gonna do is go down to the coordinate box that shows the coordinates of your cursor. And I'm gonna type in the keyword world and hit enter and a world map appears. So you can automatically have this map appear in QGIS just by typing that in. 
And now I'm going to type in user groups and we get a map of where all the national user groups are um, for QGIS. So these are national groups that organize around QGIS to disseminate information and share knowledge in their country. And you can click on one with the identify button and find out the URL of the group and things like that. And then I'm typing in contributors and I'll get a um, shot of all the contributors for QGIS where they are. So you can see they're pretty well distributed around the world, although there is a large concentration in Europe. Another way to get support is through QGIS mailing lists. So there are several lists, but I'd recommend most would just subscribe to the user mailing list initially. And this is how you can get help if you run into an issue um, or just subscribe just to see what the chatter is at the moment around QGIS. And now there's a thing called QGIS Open Day, which started as a result of the pandemic when we were no longer able to meet face to face. They started having QGIS Open Days the last Friday of every month. And it's just an online event held on YouTube. And there's usually a topic like this one last October was a plugin festival um, where people shared their favorite plugins. Um, but you can go online and find out what the next QGIS Open Day event will be. And anyone is welcome to be a speaker, even if you're um, a beginner to QGIS, you know, whatever you're working on could be of interest to other people. So um, certainly don't be shy if you want to contribute to a QGIS Open Day, you're more than welcome. So you can also follow QGIS for a variety of platforms. Um, there's a QGIS Twitter feed and a lot of the um, QGIS community communicates on Twitter regularly. You can visit the QGIS GitHub page. There's a Telegram channel, which is very active. There's several thousand people, I think, now in the Telegram channel for QGIS, where you can um, get on there and just ask questions and get help and things like that. There's a Facebook user group, and there's a lot of national Facebook user groups as well. So. I mentioned duocracy, which is just a means that if you want something done with QGIS, um, the good news is you have the power to do it, um, but you have to kind of take that power and, and actually do something with it. Otherwise, QGIS kind of falters. If we all just kind of let it go, um, QGIS would die. So it's a, it's a duocracy. So it's kind of exciting because you can actually contribute a lot of things to the project and make it better and continue the evolution of QGIS. So that's a brief introduction to QGIS and the community. And I'm gonna segue into a short case study. So this is um, an example of doing an analysis in QGIS. And so here we're gonna look for a potential site for a vineyard. Um, and it's near where I live in Denmark, the study area. And so with the site selection analysis, you usually have several criteria that you're trying to follow. So here, the land has to be currently considered grassland or cropland. It has to be on a south facing moderate slope. So we can use elevation data for that. It should have one of several specific soil types. So there's soils data we can use for that. And then it has to be big enough. So it has to be at least 1.7 hectares in size. So we're gonna run through a quick analysis on or how that would be done. Um, so we have elevation data, land cover data, and soils. And just a, a brief bit about the elevation data. So with elevation data, you can have a DTM, which is the digital terrain model, and that represents the bare earth. So the what you're seeing on the left side of this slider is the bare earth without trees or fences and things like that. And you can also have a DSM, a digital surface model that includes all of that built infrastructure, barns and trees and bridges and things. Um, so for this, we want just the bare surface. So we're going to use a digital terrain model. And so this, um, I'm going to walk through the first part of this workflow, the data preparation, which is usually the most work in an analysis. So we're taking the DTM and the land cover, and we're going to clip those to the study area. So we only have the data that we need. We're going to align the rasters, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's basically taking these pixel data sets and aligning all the pixels so they align data set to data set. So we end up with aligned data sets. We're then going to use the digital terrain model to generate a slope data set and an aspect data set. And we're going to reclassify these three data sets 
And I'll talk about that in a minute. We're basically going to aggregate them into useful categories. And we'll end up with these three. So walking through this, we're going to start with um, the digital terrain model. And we can start by just symbolizing it so we get a sense of the study area. So here we're using some of the nice tools in QGIS to make a color hill shade. QGIS comes with blending modes. And so we're using the multiply blending mode here to create a nice color hill shade effect. And on the right, um, also rendering the DTM as contours with another blending mode to create a really nice view of the terrain for the study area. Then going to align the raster pixels. So later on, if we want to combine these rasters to come up with the final site selection, we need the rasters to all be in the same coordinate system. They need to have the same pixel dimensions and they have to have all their pixels aligned. And we can use this align rasters tool in QGIS to accomplish that. This is what the aligned land cover data set looks like. And so this breaks the landscape up into different kind of functional components, tree cover versus grassland versus built up. So we're looking for areas that are grassland and cropland. So all the yellow and purple areas in this um, shot are the areas that could be suitable based on land cover. So now we're gonna do a, a basic terrain analysis. We're gonna generate slope and aspect. There's a toolbox in QGIS for creating these data sets from the DTM. So we can first create the aspect. An aspect is a measure of which direction of the compass rows the slope is facing. And here I've, I always like to style my output data sets to make sure it went properly and I can make sense of the data. So here the north facing slopes are shaded with a uh, dark blue, the south facing slopes are yellow. So it's this um, circular color ramp I'm using here to give that a nice intuitive um, styling. This is what the slope ends up looking like. Most of this looks green, but there are some steep slopes um, in a couple of places that if we zoomed in, we'd see um, some red pixels in those areas. And then we enter the, the reclassifying step. So here, um, the reason we need to reclassify these is the, the slope data, for example, um, is a, da a data type called float32, which we don't need to worry about all the details of that. But this data type can hold this huge number of different values. And this is simply too much detail for what we need. We're really just worried about whether uh, a slope is between six and 15%. We don't need it out to you know 10 decimal places. So we're gonna aggregate this into different categories where um, basically from one to four, where four is the best for a vineyard and one is worst for a vineyard. So the Pixels that end up getting a four after the reclassified will be between six and 15 degrees of slope, and they'll be on south facing slopes. And so that'll be the ideal place. And, and one will be the opposite of that. So here's the um, original land cover. And after we reclassify it, we can end up with all the suitable land cover having a value of one, and the unsuitable land cover having a value of zero in this case. So um, land cover is good, being handled a little differently than slope and aspect um, because we're gonna basically use this as a mask. We're gonna be able to um, multiply the, these. And so any pixel that has a zero in land cover won't be part of the final solution, but the areas that have a one are suitable land cover and will be part of the solution. So this last part gets into this thing called raster algebra or map algebra. And this is one of the benefits of using raster data is that we have these raster data sets all aligned and they all have this um, numeric value for each pixel. And what we can do in QGIS is combine those raster layers mathematically. So we can add two rasters together to get a sum. We can divide um, two rasters or subtract one from another and, and things like that to figure out where this vineyard should be. So to go through the second part of the out analysis, we're gonna take the 
RC stands for reclassified here. So we're going to take the reclassified slope and the reclassified aspect. And we're going to use the raster calculator to add those two and then divide by two. So you remember each one of these now has a value of one to four. And so the output mean slope and aspect would have a value of four if it was perfect for a vineyard and one if it wasn't. We then take the land cover, which was reclassified with zeros and ones, and we multiply that times this mean slope and aspect, and that basically removes the unsuitable land cover as this first result. So we're getting close to our answer now. And then we're going to say that, okay, this first result's going to have values from one to four, because that's the reclassified values. And we're going to consider anything over 3.5 suitable for a vineyard. So we're going to use the raster calculator to just extract those pixels. And we basically have our final result. But remember, we also had a, a suitable soils component. So what we're going to do is take this raster and convert it to a polygon, a vector data set. So we have our final result as a polygon. We're then going to incorporate the last variable soils. We're going to select the suitable soils, and then we're going to dissolve those into just one layer that is just the suitable polygons. And we're going to use the suitable polygons for soils to clip the final result. So we now have raw potential vineyards. And the last thing we have to do is figure out if it's greater than 1.7 hectares. So we calculate the hectares and we have our answer. So a lot of steps, um, which is why it helps to create a flow chart when you're doing this. So this is what that mean slope and aspect ends up looking like. So these are the green areas would be areas that meet the criteria for a vineyard based on slope and aspect, and the red would not. Then we remove the unsuitable land cover. So the unsuitable land cover would be these areas in red. So these dark green areas are areas that are now potential vineyard sites based on land cover, slope, and aspect. So we then identify those pixels with a value greater than 3.5. We convert them from raster to vector, clip the data with suitable soils, and calculate the hectares. And this ends up being our final solution here. So the potential vineyard sites here that meet all those criteria, they're on moderate south facing slopes with good land cover and good soils, and they're more than 1.7 hectares. Those are all these areas in yellow. We have quite a few to choose from in this study area. And another thing we can do with this kind of analysis is this is kind of irrespective of um, parcels or anything. So if we actually wanted to go buy a parcel that would um, be the location for this new vineyard, we'd have to know which parcels and where the parcel boundaries lie. So one thing you can do with something like this is get the parcels and then um, basically attach the raw result to those. And so the green parcels would be the ones that have the most favorable conditions for a vineyard and the red parcels would be unfavorable. And then these little white areas are the actual final solution. So we can start seeing, okay, this, this um, potential area falls almost completely within a parcel. So maybe we want to go after that and see if that's for sale or what the cost would be. So a little more pragmatic approach at the, at the end there. So I know I went through a lot of steps really fast. So don't worry about all the steps. I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what would be involved in kind of doing an analysis like this in QGIS. So I think I'm pretty much right at the half hour mark. We have maybe, I don't know, if, if you think we have time for a question or two, that's fine, or we can move right into Sauber. The only question in the chat right now was why the area, why should the area be at least 1.7 hectares? Oh, I mean, this was actually a hypothetical scenario. So um, that's kind of a, a, an arbitrary number, honestly. Um, this right. was just... So, but but typically in a site selection analysis, you may you may know there may be something related to cost, or you know there's going to be some kind of minimum size of below which it doesn't make economic sense to have a vineyard, for example. So right. um, I'm just going you to need, assume that grapes. yeah, there was some some kind of um, metric that went into that decision. We're going to assume. So this is my contact information. You can find me uh, on Twitter at geomenke or curtitseptimo.dk is my email. So 
um, email me if you have any follow-up questions as well. Um, and I will stop sharing and turn it over to Saber. Thanks, good. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Brilliant. Uh, I am going to present you some of the work we have done on the uh, QGIS side of things, what we have been working on in terms of the development. So we are QGIS developers, and we have added some features to this software. One is uh, point clouds or LIDAR. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, QGIS contains lots of components and point clouds. There is a piece of software, a library that handles the LiDAR data. Uh, it's uh, more of a command line, uh, not a graphical tool. You can't see the data. So what we did, we integrate that into QGIS and made it possible to see mm, LiDAR data in 2D and 3D. Uh, then uh, another piece of work we have been heavily involved and started it uh, in 2017 is QGIS 3D. So you can visualize data that in 3D map, 3D canvas, things like terrain data, building, uh, LiDAR data, any, any data which really you can assign elevation to, you can see it in 3D. Vector tile is another custom type of data. I, uh, it's been widely used in web maps, but we have added the support for it in uh, QGIS as well. Another one is MDAL or mesh data, which is uh, things like uh, uh, output from uh, hydrological, oceanography, weather data, hydraulic data like river simulation. So all those numerical models produce data that are not necessarily in a regular grids. They are triangular, even more uh, uh, mesh edges. So we have introduced some a library first and then QGIS uh, integration with QGIS so you can style the data and uh, do some analysis with it as well. And uh, this, uh, or I just want to have a pitch for um, another piece of software which we have developed, which is uh, a mobile app uh, for data collection. This is uh, completely based on QGIS. So you can prepare your data in QGIS and take it in the field and uh, start uh, collecting data. And we offer a service that uh, you can synchronize it and bring the data back to QGIS. Uh, then the last part that I want you to have a look and uh, ideally contribute to is our latest uh, uh, crowdfunding to introduce LiDAR processing, point cloud processing to QGIS. Uh, we can see the total cost of the project uh, and we are 60% there. Uh, with this crowdfunding, we would like to introduce um, a framework inside QGIS so you can uh, go and collect uh, LiDAR data using your drone. At the moment, it's possible to visualize it, but uh, then having this uh, processing framework will allow you to classify your data and uh, create uh, various derived data set using its uh, terrain model out of your data. So it's a comprehensive project. And as Kurt mentioned, this uh, open source, there is no single customer to pay for these things and uh, there is no product owner and companies like us or people who team up with us, uh, they, we collaborate and uh, put together a proposal to the community and try to raise funds to implement those features. Excellent. So this is uh, about the case studies and what we are doing behind the scene to make this software usable for users. Uh, in addition, I have got a uh, workshop. I shared the link with you in question and answer, or no, I might have done that. Uh, so you should have access to the data uh, and this folder data uh, tutorial. Uh, and also 
the Google Doc, which uh, walks you through step by step how to do view shed analysis. If you, for example, want to install a wind farm or a, a wind turbine or a pylon or uh, a tall building, uh, this is uh, the type of analysis you do to see uh, the visual impact of the new structure. And uh, with this tutorial, you should be able to follow step by step. The data are provided as well. And uh, you should be able to see how far you will be able to see these two pylons uh, and who will be able who will see it. I stop sharing and then start sharing my QGIS. Uh, uh, any questions so far? Anything I can answer before moving to tutorial? One question. Is the data collector similar to ArcGIS survey one, two, three? Uh, very closely, and uh, it's uh, it has got uh, with ArcGIS. I think you might need to work uh, uh, online, but with this one, you can fully work offline, and there is a collaboration mode. You can synchronize, and your data will be consolidated uh, properly once you are back online. And let me share the document again, and then I walk you through the. Um, tutorial, carry out the tutorial. If you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. I start with a blank QGIS. Uh, so when you have a QGIS session like this, if there is no data loaded, you don't have any information in your layer tree, you can usually drag and drop data. I have a terrain data here, so I can drag and drop it here and immediately you'll be able to see that uh, it doesn't have any coordinate reference system. So I can assign the coordinate reference system, uh, which is British National Grid, and uh, coordinate reference system for this. The map will be British National Grid. So uh, you can change the style of that uh, raster. Uh, you have symbology, Let's uh, change it to hill shade and with a bit of exaggeration because it's in UK and uh, uh, it's very flat. Well, England, sorry. So it will be something like this. You can duplicate the layer and change the top layer again to have it uh, uh, sync up and pseudo color with something a bit more. Uh, create a new color ramp gradient. Oops, sorry. And uh, let's see if there is any topography elevation like this. Uh, and we can, I have assigned a symbology here and uh, set the transparency. And you can also change the blending mode. Uh, I do it very quickly, but you can play with it. Not a good idea to play with it. The transparency, I see. Uh, I am not a good cartographer, so I apologize. Uh, okay, let's let's do this, and then uh, uh, you can also um, add the. Uh, Contour styling to it as well, if you want. Uh, I don't know if you work with contours. So duplicate the layer and this one, uh, we can change the style to be a contour style. Every 10 meter, uh, five meter and the main contour every 10 meter. And let's set it as white. So you can see the contours as well live. And the question is now to uh, 
calculate the line of sight. We have two points. The address of those points are uh, located here. So in this text file, uh, X, Y, and P, I, D. So what I can do, I can add those two points using uh, the limited text loader. And uh, here, uh, data tutorial locations. Uh, so we have point one and two. Projection will be uh, British National Grid X, Y. Don't have any other field. So these are the two points. I just turn off the raster and probably set this one. Uh, be less pixelated. Uh, Okay, uh, so these two points, we want to run uh, uh, the module we want to run is view shed analysis. I have, uh, you need to go to processing toolbox, open the toolbox here and search for view shed. Uh, so the DTM visual is our terrain, the coordinates of uh, this uh, is, uh, for the point. This is the elevation above the ground, uh, let's say 1.75. I don't change any of those parameters. You need to read the manual if you want to know what those things are. And then hit run. When you run the algorithm, it does some calculation and it gives you the visibility based on that point. So if you have uh, probably the height, I should have changed it to the height of the pylon. I leave it for you to do it, but uh, so the closer you are to that point, uh, the darker the red will be. I have a more visibility, you can see these flat areas I can see it, but from this side, no one can see it from the other side. You can repeat it for the other point uh, and uh, then do a raster calculator at those two and it gives you the overlapping area. I've done, sorry, something wrong. So elevation mode of DTM, the second point. So that's, uh, the visibility from the other pylon. And now if I do a raster calculator and uh, is do in visibility of these two, I can create it. Uh, uh, I don't need to, to create a new one. It's just on the fly and press OK. Uh, I can change this. Uh, to uh, zero hundred and eighty uh, single pseudo color. Okay. So it will be the area visible. It will be something like this. I've done it on the hoof, so <laughs> no validation. You should take my words for it, but uh, it's uh, generally the way you do the analysis in QGIS. 
Okay, I stopped my screen uh, share and you have got the data, you have got the tutorial, you need to follow the tutorial uh, uh, from page three. Uh, is it page two or three? And this page, uh, workshop. And uh, it should be all clear. If you have any question, I'm in the chat and you can raise hand and I, I'll try to answer it. Thank you, Saber. We have a hand up. No problem. So yeah, usually uh, everyone will be busy doing the training. Uh, I assume you all have installed QGIS and uh, have got all the tools. Go ahead, Carlos, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. About seismic data, I have. Uh, it, we need to get some sort of information about it. Usually it's either in net CDF or HDF or some sort of a raster and uh, QGIS should be able to support it either as a mesh data or as a, a raster data. If you have some sample, uh, you can pass it to me. I don't know if there is a way to paste it in the q and I can try and download and see if it works, but uh, it's very likely that it works. We have uh, some other questions in the, um, um, the first one. They're saying uh, it looks similar to a multi-criteria decision analysis. I think that was yeah. related to Kurt's um, presentation for trying to select the potential vineyard area. Mm, okay. Uh, there is a question about uh, what's the best way to learn QGIS. Uh, I highly recommend Kurt's book, uh, Discover QGIS 3. It uh, covers, I put the link in the chat. Uh, let me see. I, there was a question about books, and I pasted the Locate Press link into the question. So hopefully that's there now. Yeah, but the book Discover QGIS 3X, the second edition, is now updated to QGIS 326. And it starts out with the basics of um, learning about GIS data models. And then it builds into spatial analysis. It actually includes a chapter on that vineyard analysis that I showed. It's from the book. There's a section of the book on data management that covers um, how to work with merge and maps and do a data collection form and use that merge and map system. There's a section on cartography and a section on advanced data visualization that covers how to work with mesh data and symbolize terrain and things like that. So it's a pretty thorough treatment of the features in QGIS. Uh, there is a question about changing uh, transparency of the whole group. Um, uh, I don't think it's possible. But uh, a good point. If there is any feature you want or some issues you have, uh, QGIS is hosted the code of it on uh, GitHub, and you can uh, create a feature request or um, reporting an issue. And uh, usually, developers are very nice and they can consider adding those or fixing your problem. But if you have uh, you work for an organization, it's always good to get your organization to sponsor those fixes or features, and uh, it will be a very quick turnaround. And it goes back to what Kurt mentioned in terms of the democratizing the usage of software. There will be lots of developers who will be willing to add those kind of features with, if you are willing to fund it. I'm not sure if this has to do with ArcGIS having proprietary raster formats or what, but I was recently trying to use a geo database that had rasters inside it and learned that this doesn't really work with QGIS. I don't know if one of you could talk about that, if there, if this is just something to do with ArcGIS and their proprietary raster formats, or if this is something that will be added at some point or. Yeah, Sabar, maybe you know more, but it's, I do recall that there was not support for rasters in Esri file geodatabases. Um, I heard some chatter, I think, about that being worked on, but I'm not sure it has ever gotten to the point where QGIS supports rasters in file geodatabases. And if, if it does, it's very new. 
Uh, I, I read actually recently, very recently, that it's been implemented in uh, uh, GDAL, which is the library QGIS uses for handling the file formats. Uh, it's, uh, I'm 60% sure. I'll have a Google and find the link and paste it to you. But generally, yeah, this is the kind of uh, uh, vendor lock in that you face with proprietary software. They try to have a format that you can only use it in their own software. Great, thanks. Uh, Saber, I had another question for you. I, I noticed your QGIS uh, window kind of had a different color scheme from maybe the default. How do you change that? Uh, if you go to uh, settings, options, and uh, general, the uh, style, uh, if you change it to, uh, sorry, the UI theme, if you change it to the blend of gray, mine is blend of gray, but you can have night mapping as well, so it will be all dark. Oh, cool. Great. Thanks. I can see uh, the extension uh, such as uh, Geosoft and ArcGIS. Does QGIS also have a way to uh, put in Geosoft data? Uh, I can uh court mentioned that we have python support in qgis and with having python in qgis uh, there are hundreds if not thousands of uh, plugins or extensions available to qgis for custom data and workflows so yeah there are i don't know about geosoft i can quickly search here see if there is a geosoft but there are hundreds of uh, new uh plugins uh, hundreds of existing plugins and there are all new ones coming in I, I kind of had a question related to that um is it do you think it's generally faster say you wanted to clip a bunch of rasters with a polygon or something is it probably faster to do that you know using batch processing inside qgis or calling it with a sort of with the pipe through Python from the command line or something and sort of batch processing it yourself using Python. There are many ways of doing it. One would be, uh, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the processing, there is a batch mode. So you create one simple algorithm and then run it in batch mode, define a bunch of inputs, a bunch of uh, yeah, parameters, and then it will loop through all the inputs and creates the output for you. So that's one way. Or uh, if you want to do it uh, programmatically, you can always write your own Python code. That could be a bit of, um, if you are new to Q Python and PyQGIS, uh, it depends on how fast you can code that. But then there is another one that this data manipulation is always with uh, GDAL. Uh, OGR, and if you open uh, uh, OSGO for W, if you are using Windows or if you use uh, Mac OS, it's built in your terminal window. And you can write a simple bash script and uh, go through all the files and uh, manipulate the data using GDAL. So you essentially don't need even QGIS to do most of uh, data manipulation. Yeah, that last uh, option was that I was going to suggest. I think that would be the most efficient way, whether whether it's vector or raster using GDAL and OGR. Usually, the the, the command line utilities are very efficient. Um, a GIS platform for an industry management application. How does it work in terms of licensing or restrictions for commercial use? Are you talking about QGIS specifically? Um, they they don't say. I would say I would say since this is about QGIS, uh, that yes. Yeah, or, or maybe if they if they build a application on top of QGIS or leveraging QGIS, like what are the licensing restrictions? Saber, you want to take that one? I mean, Q, QGIS is commercial software. It is um, open source, but uh, Saber, you can probably explain. You know, there is. Possible. Yeah, yeah, the QGIS application, it's, uh, we um, deploy it on multiple government and private organizations. There is no licensing limitations. Uh, the licensing generally with open source software is that if you want to modify something, you need to 
and you pass the, mod the modified software, the binary, then you need to release the code uh, to that person who you publish it. Let's say you create, uh, I, I give you an example, uh, you create a custom drill hole viewer for, based on QGIS because you can call QGIS uh, through uh, Python or C++ or some other programming and create your own visualization tool, which at the core of it is QGIS. And there are many, many applications like that, which are based on QGIS. So once you create that uh, software, you can distribute it but you will be obliged to also distribute the modified code uh, so uh, you can still sell it but the thing is if somebody has got access to the code they can with a bit of expertise they can compile it and create their own application that's why selling the open source software directly doesn't work like proprietary software but this whole point of having QGIS on enterprise and uh, uh, in, in an organization, that, that's all possible and there is no limitation in using the software. I see a question um, says, I'm used to ArcGIS. I do most of my projects there. Is it possible to open my ArcGIS work in QGIS and vice versa? Uh, <clears throat> well, there, there's a one-way street there. Um, one of the cutest developers has developed a, a plugin uh, called Slayer, S L Y R, and this is basically an Esri compatibility suite. There's a community edition, and there's a licensed edition. Most of the functionality is available through the community edition, though, which is free, and it has a series of tools in the toolbox for opening MXDs, ArcGIS Pro documents. Um, all the different layer AVLs, um, even old ArcD3 documents, um, all, all of those PMFs, SXDs, and the, that that functionality is also available in the from the browser panel just by right clicking on an MXD if you have that, and you can pull an MXD right into QGIS, and it will open up with all the same symbology and all the print layout settings that you found in the ARC environment. But I don't think anyone at Esri has any uh, motive to uh, reverse engineer that and, and make it go the other direction. So Going back to your question, uh, I had a look, and there is only one tool uh, that I could find. and. Um... It looks like a source code. You need to compile it and run it. So it's a bit of a dead end at the moment with reading clusters from ArcGIS geodatabase. Yeah, I found that um, that GitHub repo myself when I was kind of going through this and wasn't able to compile it, but I didn't try it that hard. I think I just had some issues with my local Java development environment or something. But so I, I, I looked at that issue QGIS enhancement proposal. So it's, you know, people are talking about working on it and it is in progress, but unknown when it will actually get integrated, eh? Uh, these kind of things, it's everything is possible. It's just uh, uh, how much money you want to throw at it. <laughs> and uh, things like uh, this, uh, uh, it's a bit um, uh, risky as well. You uh, read, the raster format and then in the next release they make it uh, make some minor tweak and you you need to redo everything or re-implement it so that's right. why usually there is a consortium open geospatial consortium which monitors this kind of thing and uh, the only way it's uh, in europe we have something called inspire uh, which is like a European-wide uh, legislation, government uh, uh, enforcing it on all the data produced or received by government to be in some sort of open standard and compatible. I see a question, is it possible in QGIS for more than one person to work on the same project? And generally speaking, no, but <clears throat> this is... Um, potentially a use case, I think, for Mergen Maps, maybe Sauber can speak to that, but Mergen Maps 
can essentially, in my mind, is almost like Git for QGIS projects with all the versioning that it provides. So you could have a QGIS project on uh, merge and maps and use merge and maps to resolve um, edits to that project amongst multiple users. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much one of the design criteria we had for merging maps. Uh, if you want also, there are some solutions. If you want constant online, if you are all, always online, you can use some combination of central geodatabase using PostGIS, PostgreSQL as well. But if you work with file-based data sets, it's uh, merging maps can handle that easily. Uh, yeah, I had another question. Um, the batch processing module in QGIS, does it, uh is there any way does it process in parallel or is it sort of sequential sequentially uh i think it's uh let me think i think it's sequential there is one module that it's uh using uh, opencl and that uses graphic cards so that would be yeah that one uh, enable OpenCL. So if you have got an OpenCL uh, compatible graphic card, you can use uh, uh, enable that feature. And it's uh, not all algorithms, but some of the algorithms will can use the parallelization there. Great, thanks. We have a question um, from Jack. When using uh, merging maps for data collection, how is collect? How is Collected data integrated with existing data sets. Cloud hosting? Uh, I had another question um, for you, Kurt. The, I really liked the, the time lapse um, data visualization that you showed. What is the, say I have a, a um, shape file that has polygons and they have, you know, 10 different values for each polygon that sort of represent something at different times. What What's the module that you use to like make a, a visualization of this in QGIS and QGIS. So QGIS has a, a temporal controller. Um, if you're looking at QGIS, um, I could share my screen. So basically the temporal controller has a variety of ways to support time. So this, this little icon here, uh, the clock opens up the temporal controller panel in QGIS. Okay. Um, when I have a layer like this mesh data set that is temporally aware, you get the little clock icon in this indicator space. It tells okay. you it's a temp temporal layer. Um, so if I open up the layer properties for this in layer properties now, there's a temporal tab. And so you can use this to enable time for a given layer. And this mesh data set has time being baked into it. So QGIS knows the start and end time for this data set al already. But if I open up another data set, just like this country's data set, which actually doesn't have any time associated with it, but I go to the temporal tab for this data set. If I wanted to, I could enable time for this data set. And then I could configure it in different ways. So I might have an attribute column that has a timestamp. It has to be a, a date time field. And if, if that's true, I can choose a single field with date time, or I can, I might have a data set that's set up with separate fields for start and end time or dur event duration and things like that. Or if it doesn't have uh, any time in the attribute table, I can simply choose fixed time range and I can assign the start and end time um with these controls right here so it's fairly straightforward to configure a layer so that it's temporarily aware and then once it is you use these controls in the temporal controller to um slide back and forth through time and uh, see the the result on the screen so here's hurricane ian right when it's about to uh hit you know fort myers and in that whole area so you see the current time frame and then there's tricks for like the the label itself there's also some variables that come with the temporal controller so the way you put this timestamp on the map is this is simply a point data set 
that is not being symbolized and it's so it's using no symbols but it's being labeled with an expression uh, to grab time so the the expression for this is the the key to this is the map start time variable so this map start time variable is the time stamp of the current frame in QGIS so it's basically just formatting that into a nice looking timestamp, but it's just being labeled with the map start time essentially. And so that's how you get the, the timestamp on the map. Okay. Um, so I guess you either need to have like a time column or a separate time object to show it. And I, I guess if you use the fixed time interval, it just will cycle through all of the features or all of the like uh, fields rather. Or... Yeah. Yep. Okay. It'll just it'll redraw those. Um, well, it'll it'll draw them based on the, the time frame. So, if 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 my time stamp isn't, if if my layer doesn't have time that corresponds to the current time frame, it won't be shown on the map. You know, it's it's the map is only showing data that is existing in the current time frame. Okay. And then, um, yeah. So you you can set it up and then you can basically export using this button, the animation out into a series of still frames that you can use to produce an animation in another software. And you can control the steps. So here I, it's being set every six hours, um, but you could um, set the step to any unit of time, depending on what your use case is. So cool. a really powerful Thanks. feature. Yeah. You could even use this, for example, if you had a series of air photos from different years, but you could just tell QGIS what the, the timestamp was for each one, and then they would come in to uh, come on to be rendered on the map when the time slider hit the time and date of that particular air photo. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I have I have some data that shows, you know, aggregate risk in certain areas in Florida over sort of with sea level rise, how it changes. And I want to make a little temporal a time lapse of that because I think that'd be cool. Yeah, that so. mesh data structure that's used for this animation I showed was is also really good for um, those kind of output. Of, a lot of flood models output that kind of data and you can use that to see inundation over time and things like that as well. Cool. Uh, I pasted a chat from uh, Hans where it shows the dust uh, coming from Sahara to Europe. It's quite a very nice uh, animation. Basically, this is the first time you've seen QGS. Uh, and so he's uh, asking, um, is it possible to create a plot, a 2D graphic example, uh, scatter XYZ, etc., in QGS and visualize them? I'm using GMT, which is generic mapping tool for these kinds of plots, but sometimes it bothers me to use many codes. Yeah, uh, this gets into QGIS plugins. So there's a plugin called Data Plotly in QGIS that allows you to create um, a lot of different kinds of plots. All right, uh, we have and, uh, someone. Oh, I'm sorry. So so anyway, you you can you can just enable the plugin Data Plotly, and it will have a panel that will allow you to generate I don't know, nine or 10 different kinds of plots based on your data. And also, you yeah. print layout. Yeah, uh, another tool that we have uh, added last time as a part of our um, uh, crowdfunding campaign was the native profile tool, which you can create really nice profiles from rasters, vector, mesh, and uh, point clouds that I try to find. Uh, 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 an animation of it, but yes, there are several options. Okay, we have um, an attendee with their hand up. So um, if you would like to go ahead and uh, ask your question directly, that would be uh, doable. Okay, how online data can be available uh, on the QJS, Quantum JS? How could I find the data online? Yeah, it depends on data, what type of data, if uh, uh, you are looking at... Uh, raster, raster data, raster data and vector data, especially 
uh, NDBI uh, agriculture growth index uh, data. Usually you should look into uh, the data providers' websites and uh, there are they either uh, offer you a direct download or some sort of a web mapping service that you can call directly from QGIS. So yeah, there are lots of data. As an example, you can download elevation models for whole Europe or globally from NASA or ESA websites. If you want to download meteorological data, uh, you can check NOAA. If you want vector data, again, what type of vector? Uh, if it's base map, you can download it from OSM map. There are some tools. So there are lots and lots of uh, sources. You just need to search uh, for them. OK, OK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No problem. I know um, QGIS is a software on its own, um, and Python itself is another different thing altogether. I want to know the link between this um, Python programming language and then the QGIS, please. I just posted a link. There's a QGIS Python API. And so you can look at the documentation for that. So you can use that API to um, make calls to different parts of the QGIS interface, different processing tools, um, identify layers, uh, all that sort of thing. The whole QGIS um, interface is exposed to the API, so you can do quite a bit with it. OK. All right, thank you so much, sir. All right, we have uh, questions in the Q&A box. I want to uh, simulate the impact of roof water harvesting on flooding. Is there a tool in QGIS to do this? If not, do you know uh, of any I could use uh, to do this? Thanks. I, I just responded to that. Uh, the short answer is uh, there is uh, there are some modules that does some basic flood in the inundation. But if you want uh, uh, actual uh, uh, hydraulic process to be simulated, then you need a, a software, a hydraulic engine like Hecras or Anuka, which are uh, free. Anuka is open source as well. And then you run the model. But once you finish running the model, you can bring in the model results and outputs and create all sorts of animations in uh, QGIS uh, uh, and all those formats are compatible. Thank you. Paste the link in the uh, in response as well, so you can see some examples of flood data animation. There's another question in the Q and A box. I work in the exploration industry. What is the best way to plan an exploration survey? We always left this to our specialists, and I am very new to QGIS, and I would like to help in this part of the process. Uh, the uh, book uh, Discover QGIS 3 that Court mentioned has got a chapter on planning survey, setting up forms, etc. in uh, QGIS and using uh, Merging Map mobile app to take it in the field and do the survey. So it walks you through all the steps. And I guess the next question is, would you attach user's guide for QGIS? I'm pretty sure that we have all of that. Um, when we were advertising um, this uh, webinar, there's all kinds of resources. Thank you both for your presentation. No. Thank you guys so much both for coming and talking about QGIS. It's uh, been very helpful for me personally, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone else who attended learned a lot. And um, yeah, it was a great presentation. QGIS is a very powerful piece of software for being open source. So I'm also very grateful that you both have spent so much time developing it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for very much for inviting us. And yeah, you have got our contact details. If you need any questions, best to reach us. Oh, don't worry, I will. <laughs> it's nice to be here. And uh, there's nothing I like doing more than just talking about QGIS. So uh, it was a lot of fun for me too. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And good luck. Happy QGISing. Thank you.